The following video may not be suitable for all audiences. Matter of fact, it's definitely not. Your discretion is advised. In September of 1935, the bodies of two women were discovered along a small ravine just outside Moffat, Scotland. They had clearly been murdered, and their identities were unknown. Their bodies were in pieces and badly decomposed. No witnesses. Finding the killer was going to be tough. But detectives would soon realize a key clue to this mystery was wriggling all over the remains. That's right, maggots. At first glance, maggots and other insects probably seem like a mere bone-chilling distraction to a forensic mystery, but that is not the case. For hundreds of years, they've been used in many criminal investigations. It's called forensic entomology. So put down your lunch, because today I'm going to introduce you to it, tell you about the key species, all while we solve the case of the jigsaw murders. Let's get the general information out of the way by starting with a solid definition of forensic entomology. University of Florida defines it very simply as the unique blend of insect study and solving crime. Honestly surprised I didn't know about this way earlier considering I switched from criminology to zoology in college. But the world you know of becomes more vibrant the more you live it, doesn't it? Anyway, forensic entomology can be used in many different kinds of crimes and mysteries. Contraband smuggling, pest infestations, etc. But the most infamous use is solving murder, and that is our focus for today. In order to crack the case, we have to first know what kinds of maggots and other insects we're working with, and when, and for what reasons. When you think about a dead thing, you probably think of insects, general, attracted to it. But it turns out that very specific insects get drawn to the scene at very specific stages of decomposition. I realize this is extremely unpleasant to think about, so while we're going through this, it might be easier to think about an antelope killed by a cat and for some reason wasn't eaten, or even an animal that doesn't exist anymore. Maybe a woolly mammoth. I don't know. Do whatever you want. So, right after an animal dies, the body is in stage one, the fresh stage. Cells start breaking down from the inside. But you can't see much change yet. You probably wouldn't notice anything, but blowflies do. They can show up within minutes, drawn in by chemicals called apineumones. Apineumones. Okay, I'm just gonna skip that word. Drawn in by chemicals that most humans can't smell. These flies lay eggs, usually in wounds or moist places like the mouth, nose, or eyes. No maggots yet just eggs. A couple days in, the body reaches stage two, the bloat stage. Oh. Bacteria inside produce gases, which make the body swell up. Now the smell is impossible to miss, and more insects arrive. More blowflies and also flesh flies are the main players. They lay even more eggs, or in the case of flesh flies, drop live maggots onto the body. By now the first eggs have hatched, and maggots are feeding in big moving piles. Predatory beetles might join in, feeding on the maggots themselves. By days five through 13, it's at stage three, active decay. The body opens up, fluids seep out, and a lot of the soft tissue turns to mush. This is peak maggot activity. The maggot masses get so dense and active that they actually heat up, sometimes warmer than the air around them. Rove beetles, carrion beetles, and other scavenger beetles come in to feed on both the maggots and the remaining tissue. As things dry out, like 10 to 23 days in, it's called four the post-decay, and then end, dry stage. Most of the maggots leave to pupate. And now beetles that like dry, tough material, like dermistid beetles, move in, eating up anything like dried skin or hair that's left. After that, only the hardest, driest parts remain. Just a few specialized insects stick around. Obviously, the exact timeline of decomposition depends on a ton of different environmental factors. So. Just keep that in mind. And just like these beetles have been cleaning up bones for millions of years, Rocket Money can clean up your finances. And they just so happen to be the sponsor of today's video. A couple months ago, I found out I was being charged every single month for a subscription I thought I canceled the free trial on. Isn't that the worst feeling in the world? Life is full of responsibilities, forgotten tasks, and it sucks when one of those forgotten tasks throws your money away. That's why I'm stoked to have Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money all in one place. Once you connect your accounts, Rocket Money automatically automatically finds all your subscriptions in one list. You can cancel the ones you don't want anymore with just a couple of taps. It can even help negotiate some of your bills, so no more awkward phone calls with your internet provider. And the budgeting feature shows exactly where your money's going so you can stay on track. It has genuinely been a game changer for me. I've used Rocket Money for years, but one of those phone updates uninstalled it from my phone. And just like those unwanted subscriptions, I forgot about it. Then Rocket Money reached out to sponsor this video, and I was like, first off, hell yeah. Second off, oh my god. I need to reinstall it right now. And what do you know? I canceled like five subscriptions immediately and they helped me do it. Rocket Money has helped its customers save up to $740 a year when you use all the app's premium features. And it's so nice once again knowing I'm not paying for things I don't need. Take control of your finances today. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code on your screen to get started for free. That's rocketmoney.com slash Lindsay Nicole. Now, back to the video. So we've got stage one, blowflies. Stage two, blowflies and flesh flies, along with their maggot young. Stage three, predatory beetles, and stage four, dermistid beetles. Let's start with blowflies and family Coliferidae. There's about 1,900 described species and come in a variety of metallic blue, 
green or black coloration. Their ancestors split off as specialized decomposers as early as 105 million years ago, adapting to sniff out chemical signals from decaying animals with insane precision. They can smell a dead animal from up to a mile away, considering how small they are and how big a mile is to them, relatively. That's crazy, and they're found all over the world. Each species has its own shit going on when it comes to temperature preferences, life cycle speed, even the types of carcasses it prefers. So knowing the exact blowfly species is crucial, knowing the timing of their eggs and maggots in different conditions so forensic entomologists can pin down a timeline of death. All right, next up, stage two, the flesh flies. In family Sarcophagidae, there's about 2,500 species found all over the world. And they're pretty easy to spot. Medium to large gray flies with black stripes down the thorax, their little chest piece, and a checkerboard pattern on their abdomen. Unlike blow flies, flesh flies usually skip the egg stage entirely. They're ovovib... Fuck, I can never say this word, ovoviviparous, which means they deposit live baby maggots directly onto the carcass. That gives their larva a head start letting them feed and compete right away. Fleshfly ancestors have been specializing in finding dead and decaying things, and even parasitizing other insects since at least the time of the dinosaurs. Each species has its own preferences. Some go for big carcasses, some for small. Some even target open wounds or lay their young in dead insects. So they're another key timeline tool. Knowing exactly which flesh fly showed up, how old its maggots are, helps tighten up the post-mortem timeline, even when other flies are already at work on the body. Next. Stage three, the predatory beetles, rove beetles and carrion beetles. Rove beetles are pretty heinous looking, not your typical beetle. They've got really short wing covers or elytra, which is quite unusual in the beetle world. They're in family Staphylinidae, which has 66,000 species. Yeah, a lot, which is typical beetle shit. Classic typical beetle shit. There are so many beetles. What's cool about rove beetles is they do have a fossil record. They've been around since at least the middle Jurassic so like 170 million years ago. They show up at the scene once the maggots are well established. And as you would expect, with 66,000 species, there's a lot of morphological diversity. Actually, I wanna put that into perspective really quick. There's 66,000 species of rove beetles only. That is just rove beetles. There are so many other beetles. How many mammal species are there? If you could guess, less than 7,000. Dude. Beetles are fucking nuts. Beetles are fucking off the charts. Anyway, as you would expect with 66,000 species, there's a lot of morphological diversity. Some look fuzzy, like the hairy rove beetle or Ostrospiraxa. I think that's how you pronounce that. They trick termites into feeding it by reshaping its abdomen to look like a fucking termite. Heinous, all around. It's like one of those inflatable costumes, but sick and twisted. But yeah, specific rove beetles help in the death timeline as well. Carrion beetles, subfamily Sylphidae, is much smaller at 200 species. Not typical beetle shit, but they do look like a classic typical beetle. They also show up when the maggots are in full swing and will feed on both the decomposing flesh and the maggots themselves. Sometimes even wiping out entire batches of them. So that's not good sometimes. So then they can change the whole decomposition timeline on accident, which means forensic entomologists have to watch out for them if they're trying to use maggot ages to figure out how long a body's been there. And finally, the dermistid beetles. These are the little skin beetles in the family Dermestidae. They're pretty small, not much to look at. Oval, dark brown, or black. There's like 1,700 species, and they're found almost everywhere. They show up late in decomposition, during the dry stage, when most of the other insects and maggots have cleared out. Instead of soft, fresh flesh, they want what's left behind, dried skin, tendons, hair, cartilage, even dead bugs. Their presence means the body's been there for weeks or months, long past the maggot swarm days. Outside of forensics, dermistid beetles are used to clean up skeletons for museums or taxidermists, which is pretty sick. They also have a fossil record, they're old as fuck, like late Triassic or early Jurassic, so like 200 million years ago. It's probably not surprising to find out that forensic entomology has technically been around for a long ass time. The earliest recorded use was in China back in the year 1235. A man was stabbed in the rice fields. Authorities lined up all the local farmers, told them to lay their sickles out in the sun. Only one of those sickles drew a cloud of flies, drawn to the blood invisible to human eyes. The killer confessed on the spot. Boom, case closed. Another famous example comes from France in the 1700s. A child's skeletonized remains are found in a house. Nobody knows how long those bones have been there. The finger was pointed at the family living there at the time, as one would expect. But an early entomologist came in, looked at the types of insects on the bones, was able to clear the innocent family living there. The bugs proved the child died long before they moved in. Who done it? I actually have no idea. The case might not be closed. But if you wanna keep reading about the history of forensic entomology, there is a paper titled, A Brief History of Forensic Entomology. Yes, 
a lovely and easy to remember name by Mark Benek. Maybe a spooky read for the spooky season. All right, so let's go back to the case that started all of this, the Jigsaw Murders. It's October of 1935 and investigators are facing the first challenge of figuring out who the women were. Dental records aren't much use, the teeth are gone. Eyes, ears, recognizable skin, all intentionally removed. The killer obviously went to great lengths to hide their identities, but Scraps of clothing were found with the bodies, and these were matched to the identities of two women who were reported missing, Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Rogerson. Isabella Ruxton was the wife of Buck Ruxton, a physician, and Mary Jane Rogerson was their nursemaid, or nanny, and lived with them in their house in Lancaster, England, a hundred miles away from where their bodies were found. Buck Ruxton claimed Isabella and Mary Jane had gone to visit Isabella's sister in Edinburgh on September 15th. No, 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 stop typing. I already told her it's pronounced Edinburgh. Freedom! and hadn't heard from them since. Were they attacked somewhere along the way? Dr. Ruxton also claimed he sent mail to her sisters, but it was returned, unopened. Was the sister hiding something? But here's what's strange and suspicious. Buck Ruxton's story kept shifting. He told some people they went to see Isabella's sister, tells another they ran off after an argument a few days after September 15th, and he told others that she abandoned him and left him with their three children. He also told his housekeepers not to come that weekend, so. He's looking real bad, but police need solid evidence. So the next question they look at, when did these women die? This is where the maggots come in. Their bodies were shipped in pieces to Edinburgh where scientists painstakingly reconstructed not just the flesh, but the scene. Embedded in all of that was the silent set of witnesses, the blue bottle blowfly maggots. With the body so badly decomposed, these maggots were the best clue. The entomologist at the time, Alexander Mearns, raised the larvae in a lab, checking their age and development. By plugging local temperature records from Scotland into blowfly growth charts, he was able to calculate backwards, down to when the eggs must have been laid. The result, the women had died and been dumped between September 15th and 17th. Looking real bad for you, Buck. So. Police tracked Buck's movements. He claimed to have never been near Scotland, but yep, that's right, bitch. That was a goddamn lie. On September 17th, his car had its license plate noted after he hit a cyclist halfway between Lancaster and the site where the bodies were dumped. On September 17th, every step in the investigation, Buck tried to divert suspicion, new stories, more lies, sympathy and tears, begging police to search his house to squash rumors. But the forensic scientists kept working piece by piece. How do you prove identity with bodies this destroyed? The answer was actually another forensics first. Skull x-rays were compared, superimposed by hand, over photos of Isabella Ruxton, showing distinctive matches. Shoes, a foot cast in gelatin, matched to the known size and shape of Mary Jane's shoes. Even the blood in the drains and stains in the carpet weren't totally scrubbed out. Microscopic human fat and tissue lined the pipes. The evidence was all over the place. And now, with all of that stacking up, the maggots setting the exact window of death, the house infested with evidence, clothes matching back to Isabella and Mary Jane, getting stopped on the way to Scotland. Obviously it was Buck, we know this, but now they finally had the evidence they needed to take him to the slam. The case went to trial in March of 1936. Buck doubled down on his erratic behavior, sobbing on the stand, lashing out at witnesses, changing his story every time someone poked a hole in it. His lawyer tried to argue that the forensic scientists were wrong, that these weren't even the women everyone thought they were, but strangers, somehow with the same shoes and blouses, dumped in the same ravine at the same time. Jury wasn't having it. After just over an hour of deliberation, the jury returned. Boom, guilty. Ruxton was sentenced to death. He filed appeals, but nothing worked. Even his public sympathy trickled in. For the gentle doctor so many thought they knew, justice moved forward. On May 12, 1936, he was hanged. And the final, eerie twist. The day after his execution, his handwritten confession was released to the world. He admitted to murdering Isabella in a blind, jealous rage and killing Mary Jane when she walked in on the crime. Maggots can be wretched, twisted, tough to look at, understandable. They show up in a variety of disturbing ways, but sometimes maggots and other insects can be a crucial key in solving a crime. And I think that is sick. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode coming out next week. This video topic was voted on by my patrons on Patreon. So if you want to get involved in that, start voting on some shit, go check out the Patreon where we have a Discord server and behind the scenes updates as well. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.